So, you know, the, there are many events uh, in, in the evolution of, of the Western world that were, were kind of catalysts or markers of this process. Uh, the fall of man, the separation of nature from spirit was one, um, and then all the way through to Judaism with uh, Yahweh's Ten Commandments. If you, if you think about what, it, what it's like to live your life according to uh, moral commandments, psycho what that means psychologically. I mean, each time you want to act instinctively, naturally, you have to check that impulse. Campbell makes this point. You, you, you can't just act instinctively because you're trying to live according to the dictates of Yahweh, some patriarchal God who lays down the commandments he must follow. So there's, what that does is create a psychological tension. The, the, one has to become aware of the forces that are moving us, and it, and it creates a tension between reason, rationality that's trying to live in a moral, religious manner, and the, the, the instincts that you know, we just you know, live rather unconsciously. So I think, I think that kind of development it draws forth um, ever greater self-reflective awareness, ever greater consciousness, because indiv individual human beings had to become ever more aware of you know, the, di the dynamics within them, within their psyche. So I think that had the effect of uh, separating the rational ego from the, from the instincts. And you can see this process all through the history of Western thought. I mean, um, Campbell focuses on the troubadours, the idea that the, the troubadours uh, in romantic affairs chose the person to which they wanted to give their love rather than follow the, the prescribed patterns of that time. And Campbell sees that as the um, beginning of creative mythology, creative individual mythology. So we, we get this transition from um, collective mythology, like Christianity or the Greco-Roman pantheon of gods and goddesses, over, over the centuries to the emergence of uh, creative mythology, particularly in the modern era. Now to go back to Nietzsche, Nietzsche, I think, can be seen as the uh, pinnacle of egoic alienation from this deeper ground. So it's almost like, if you imagine that the sun is of ego consciousness, and it's emerging, it emerges from the darkness of, of this participational mystique, becomes ever more separate, and rises to the pinnacle, the noon point, the apex. So Nietzsche is, in some sense, symbolic of this apex of the development of ego consciousness. But he's also extremely alienated. He's grown so far removed from the instinctive natural state that he experiences this, the crushing sense of alienation. So that is why I think that um, Nietzsche is a philosopher of nihilism. <coughs> nihilism because he he's so alienated within his own egoic existence, that he can't see any meaning outside of that. He can't see any meaning in the world. He, he wants to do away with Christianity, hence the death of God. He, he, he believes the idea, that the idea of God, the Christian transcendent father figure, is no longer, no longer valid, and this is the uh, late 19th century. So he proclaims the death of God and tries to wipe away um, basically all of religion. He, he wants to go back to before Judaism, before Christianity, certainly, to, to a kind of uh, Greco-Roman conception of um, the noble life, that it is really very, very distant from the, the Christian morality of, like, love of one's neighbor. He's, he's really uh, vehemently opposed to Christianity. So Nietzsche proclaims the, the death of God, um, but he also heralds the coming of what he calls the ubermensch, the superman or the overman two terms are often used to translate that. So I just want to read um, a couple of quotes from Nietzsche. And this is the great noontide. It is when man stands at the middle of his course between animal and superman, Ubermensch, and celebrates his journey to the evening as the highest hope, for it is the journey to a new morning. Then man, going under, will bless himself for he will be going over to the superman, 
and the sun of his knowledge will stand at noontide. So that, that's the great noontide. Nietzsche heralds, prophecies the, the descent of the sun down into the underworld. And this, of course, is a symbol of the descent into the underworld in myth, the, the individual's um, death-rebirth process. So what, what my book is about really is this, the descent that, that follows um, when, when ego consciousness reaches a point of separation from the instinctive ground, uh, the, the unconscious, from nature, there has to follow this rebirth process in order that a larger self, a new self, can be born. Uh, this is Carl Jung's idea of the self. You know, the ego is the, if we say I, that is the ego, that's the, the normal individual personality. And then the self, or for Nietzsche, the ubermensch, although the, those terms are not exactly equivalent, but they're similar. The ubermensch or the self is this greater being, this greater, more holistic being that, that has assimilated the, the power of the instincts. Because what I believe happens is when the ego develops, becomes ever more separate from the instincts, the instincts become repressed. And so this allows the ego to develop. You know, it means that if you say, you know, I, I want to do this, or I, you know, I'm deciding I want, you know, I want to do this particular course of action, you, you don't get the instincts that totally overrun you. You have a degree of volitional autonomy separate from one's emotions and the drives that are moving us. But um, in order for psychological growth, psycho-spiritual growth to move to another level, the I, the ego, has to come, in, come to terms with the instincts and the emotions that have been repressed. Now, I think that is what uh, individuation, um, the process of individuation, is to do with. This is Jung's term uh, by which the ego becomes aligned with its deeper self. This is individuation. Uh, and the essence of that is a, a death-rebirth process. The ego dies to itself to his old existence as an autonomous um, you know, ruling principle of consciousness and realizes that there's, some, there's a, deeper, a deeper authority within the psyche. Um, so what I think that Campbell's monomyth, Campbell's hero's journey model, is a, a very good symbolic illustration <laughs> of the individuation process. They're not exactly the same again. Campbell, Joseph Campbell, is more, more mystical, I would say, than Jung um, in where he takes it ultimately. But still, many of the, the phases of the hero's journey are directly relevant to, to individuation. Um, so let me read one more quote here. Um, so this, this is Jung. So um, keep in mind, again, the image of the sun reaching its apex and then having to descend uh, into the darkness of, of the ocean of the unconscious. <clears throat> so this, this is a young, he's just descri discussing Nietzsche. When a summit of life is reached, when the bud unfolds and, and from the lesser the greater emerges, then, as Nietzsche says, one becomes two. And the greater figure, which one always was, but which remained invisible, appears to the lesser personality with the force of a revelation. He who is truly and hopelessly little will always drag the revelation of the greater down to the level of his littleness, and will never understand that the day of judgment for his littleness has dawned. But the man, the person who is inwardly great, will know that the long-expected friend of his soul, the immortal one, has now really come, a moment of deadliest peril. So there's, there's so much in that quote there from Jung, but the idea of the one becoming two, when the ego, the I principle, becomes too separate from its original ground, its original instinctive existence, there, there can occur a splitting of the psyche. The psyche can split into two. The one becomes two. And this, as the quote points out, it's a moment of deadliest peril. It's a moment of great opportunity, too, because that is when the, the deeper self emerges and makes itself known to us, to consciousness. 
but it's also incredibly traumatic. It can be um, very disoriented. I mean, Jung likens this process to uh, being on a small vessel that's getting tossed around by the waves of the ocean. It's, you, know, you, can, you can lose everything psychologically that was secure to you uh, when you were living at this egoic level of existence. And, but the ego, the shell of the ego, the bud unfolds, the shell of the ego is cracked open in order that the self can emerge and that the ego can realize this, this deeper self.